Hey there! Welcome to this week's message from Centralia Christian Church. We are so glad that you are listening, and we hope this message will encourage and inspire you to walk closer with Jesus. Now sit back, relax, and let's dive into the Word together. You know, if you've been with us, then you know that we've been looking at uh, different things uh, that distract us from the true meaning of Christmas, right? So the fact that uh, Jesus came, the fact that Jesus was born uh, of a baby, not just born as a baby, but like I said, first service, he, was, uh, he grew up into a man who would end up giving his life uh, to take away the sins of the world. And guys, there's a lot of things that distract us, uh, especially this time of year. Would you agree with me? And so week one, we talked about, at the very first week, we talked about trying to create this perfect Christmas moment, right? Or, we, or try to recreate that perfect Christmas moment. So whether you had a perfect Christmas moment uh, as a child, and uh, you want that for your family, or you never had that perfect moment, and now you're looking for it, here's something that's kind of unfortunate, and you've probably discovered this yourself, that that perfect Christmas moment is super elusive, isn't it? Right? Why, why is that? Because... We haven't experienced it, but yet we think it's out there. And those are the type of things that can take our attention away from Jesus and, and really what this season, what tonight, what tomorrow is really all about. And so in, in the second week, we talked about stuff. So we talked about material possessions. We talked about consumerism, materialism, commercialism. We, we talked about all the money that there's an estimated this year, it's estimated that $957.2 billion will be spent on Christmas this year in the United States. Isn't that crazy? Uh, but all that going into trying to make the perfect moment. And again, I want you to hear something, that having presents and all that stuff is not bad in and of itself, okay? But it can become a distraction, can't it? Last week, then, we talked about, uh, again, relational expectations and uh, something that God says, hey, guys, these, these are good. Relationships are good. And it's something that each of us have in our lives. Some of the relationships we have in our lives are good. Some of the relationships we have in our lives are kind of dysfunctional. But if our focus is on a human relationship and not our relationship in Christ, then again, would you agree that we're missing it? Yeah. And we can get distracted, Right? And so if you've missed any part of the series, you can go online, you can listen to it. Uh, we encourage you to get CDs in the back, uh, but get caught up with us. But this week, I want to talk about stress and anxiety versus perspective and peace, right? And so all the things that we just talked about can add stress, can add worry, uh, can, it can just suck the joy and peace out of this time of year, can it? And honestly, for me, one of the great stress distractions for me is gifts, because, not because I'm a, I, I'm a gift person, it's because I am not a gift person, okay? So how many of you are not gift people? That is not your love language. Praise the Lord, there's some of you in here. How many of you that your primary love language is gifts? Like you love to give gifts, like you, yeah, girl, yeah, I see you, right? But that's not mine, right? It leaves me with questions. This is how stressed out I get. It leaves me with questions like, how much money should we spend, right? Or is there a limit to too much? Or is there a limit to too little? What if you buy gifts for people in the same family? Does it have to be the same price that you spend on everybody? Right? Like, is my brother going to feel gypped because I didn't spend as much money on him as maybe another sibling? Right? Because you all know siblings talk, don't you? Yeah, you know you talk, right? And so... And even the question of, I put a lot of time and thought into this, are they even going to like my present? Yeah, right? These are things that are distractions to me. Now, I love funny, witty quotes. And when I was doing a lot of research for this, uh, for this message, I came across some funny things that people say this time of year. And I'm going to share with you some of those quotes throughout the message, right? And so, again, here's one of them that has to do with gifts, and I thought it was really funny. It's from a guy I found from the name of Anthony Jeselnik. Don't know who he is, just, you know, found this. And he says, this past Christmas, I told my girlfriend for months in advance that all I wanted for Christmas was an Xbox, okay? Beginning and end of list, Xbox. Do you know what she got me? 
a homemade frame with a picture of us from our first date together, which was fine because I got her an Xbox, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff that distracts me, right? Gifts and that kind of stuff. But you know what? A lot of us can't even think of a gift that was meaningful. So let me ask you a question. Can you think of a gift right now where you're like, man, here was a Christmas gift that was super meaningful to me? Now, what I find is that a lot of people can't do it. But if they can, oftentimes it comes from their childhood, Okay, so if you can think of a gift that was meaningful for, to you at Christmas, turn to the person next to you and tell them. And if you can't, turn to the person next to you and tell them that, well, maybe we should wait on that. I was thinking about this, like I said, first service caught myself on this, right? Because that could be really awkward, right? Because maybe the person sitting next to you, right, gave you a gift last year and you're thinking, I just can't think of a meaningful gift that I've ever been given, right? So I'm about saving relationships this Christmas. But when I was a child, and now again, every once in a while, I see people that are adults, right, and, and they have a gift that was super meaningful, right? For some, it was a trip they took with their family. Maybe they got engaged close to Christmas, and they show you the ring, right? Um, but for most people, it's as a child, and that was the case for me. And for me, and this is disputed in my family, by the way, because so my dad's here, so I'm just going to say this. It was when my grandfather gave me his electric slot car racetrack with electric slot cars. Now, my dad said it was his. I'm not for sure, right? But we want to have peace today, so it was my dad's. So, hey, I'm all about peace, right? But, kids, I need you to understand this, right? Back then, right, we did not have video games that could actually simulate real racing. We had to make believe, right? Right? And, and so there were these tracks that you could set up in a circle or, or whatever, and it had a slot down the middle of them, right? And, and you had this car that had like a little thing that you put on, and, and you know, it's called electric slot cars, right? And each of you had a controller, right? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, good. So you have this controller, and you can adjust the acceleration, you can adjust the velocity. One, you could go too fast, and the car would go flying off the track, but if you went too slow, right, you lost the race. Now, this is one of the, uh, that I remember at Christmas and oftentimes I think about a lot. But here's the thing about that gift. For me, the gift had to do with people that were with me, right? Like if, if I was by myself, it was no fun to play because why? You just watch the car go around the track, right? And it would get boring, in fact, most of the memories that I have, right, are good, that, that anyway that are good, have to do with relationships, have to do with people around me. So whether it was watching Christmas cartoons with my parents and my brother, whether it was the big meals with the extended family, right, most of my memories have to do with being around people and especially family, right? We, we didn't live, we grew up in Tacoma, we didn't really live in an area where we had a bunch of extended family, so, you know, oftentimes, we sometimes we take trips at Christmas, spring break. We go back east to visit, you know, family back there. And, and I think about those relationships with my cousins that I got to build during that time, right? And those are still relationships that, that are dear to me today. Um, honestly, as a child, I think I would have given up all my gifts if that was the price of admission was to go spend it with my extended family, right? So for me, Christmas as a child was so much less stressful. Why? Because I wasn't distracted by all the stuff, right? And so each week we've been looking at the Christmas story, and I think we've pretty much dispelled that, Chris, that this Christmas story was anything, was not nice, it wasn't fluffy, it wasn't cute, right? It, where everything went the way that everybody thought it was going to go? No, it didn't. But what we did learn is that this was perfect in whose eyes? In God's eyes. This was the perfect Christmas moment in God's eyes. But from a human standpoint, it was an absolute train wreck for the people that were involved, right? The society in which Mary and Joseph lived had everything to do with family relationships. And the fact that nobody was there for the birth of Christ, I mean, some of you have those relationships too, don't you? I mean, talk about a tough pregnancy. 
Can you think of a more difficult pregnancy? Pregnant out of wedlock, right? Joseph almost divorced her. They had to travel 90 miles or so on foot, on camel or on donkey, right? But either way, Mary was big, beautiful, and pregnant, right? And it was uncomfortable, which I tell you the reason I say that, because first service, you know what flipped out of my mouth? Big, fat, pregnant is what came out of my mouth, first service. Yeah, you, you know, like I was saying, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't catch me on that one, did it? No. And so I had to kind of recreate this to big, beautiful, and pregnant. But you know what? It was uncomfortable, wasn't it? In her ninth month, they had to travel 90 miles. There was no family to host them. There was no room in the inn. There was stress and anxiety involved all throughout the story. Let me ask you a question. By a show of hands, how many of you right, Neil, right now feel stress about some aspect of the next 24 to 36 hours, 48 hours. Anybody besides me? Yeah. You know why? Because a lot of you folks, as I was looking at are cooking, hosting, all that kind of stuff, but some of you guys aren't finished shopping yet, are you? That's stressful, isn't it? Right? But in this story, we see a short distance away that there are some shepherds minding their own business. Well, it's a day like any other day. And an angel appears to them, and in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, and I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation today, it says this, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory, excuse me, surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today <coughs> Excuse me, in the city of David, in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So I want you to notice that this was an announcement of great joy. It was supposed to bring great joy to all people, including us sitting here this morning, right? There should be no other time of year where you and I have more joy as we remember that announcement that the Savior of the world had arrived on planet Earth, okay? He came to take away our huge problem, our sin problem, the one thing that could keep us away from eternal blessing in relationship with God. And by the way, shouldn't that bring us great joy? But Brad, if that's the case, and you're telling me that's the case, then why do so many of us struggle to, to get joy this time of year? Well, let me tell you, because we get distracted. And not just distracted, we get distressed, we get anxious, we get worried about all the things that take our focus from him. There's a song on the Christian radio <clears throat> by Johnny Diaz called Just Breathe. Anyone ever heard of that song before? I mean, just a few of you. But every time I hear it, even as I was standing here for service, I get a little convicted, and here's why. For me, there's times where I do get stressed. I get anxious, right? Sometimes it's about stuff that would stress any one of us out. But sometimes it's just because I don't have my head in the right space, in the right place. And so I'm not focused on the fact that the Savior came, came to take care of my biggest sin problem. And everything else is just stuff. So watch the video here, and here's the song. Chaos calls 
Just breathe. Can any of you relate to that? Man, I can. You know, the external pressures of things that are happening in my life. Sometimes, you know, I have a lot of stuff that replays in my head. Anybody else have a lot of things that replay in your head all the time? Yeah, it can just take me away. You know, I can feel the tension, and, and sometimes I have to do just what that says. I just have to breathe, right? Sometimes I have to put down what's good for what's, in, for what's best. Did you catch that? Sometimes we have to pick, put down what's good in our life for sometimes for what's best. And so the song is talking about a peace that comes from God, right? It's not deep breathing exercises, but it's a peace that comes from God, right, that, you know, if we'll take a moment to slow down and to listen to what he wants to say to us. Right, Because in our story in Luke chapter 2, the proclamation of the angels is interesting to me. Right, I mean, think of all the angels, right? I mean, the angels could have said anything. You know what they didn't say? They didn't say, oh man, you humans are in for it now, right? You sinners are finally going to get what you deserve. The king of kings, the lord of lords, he's, he's going to come and he's going to crush his enemies under his feet. Is that what the angels said? No, listen to what, again, what the angel said. He said said this. Suddenly an angel was joined by a vast host of others, the army of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Now that word peace in the Greek is that Greek word arene, and it's not just talking about peace that you get from, like I said, those deep breathing exercises. It's a peace that can only come from the Messiah, the Savior, the one who is the Prince of Peace, and Jesus came to bring peace. But if that's true, if Jesus came to bring peace, then why do we struggle so hard to have it, especially this time of year? I mean, this is the time of year. It should be the greatest time of peace that we have as we remember what God's done for us, right? Now, I believe the reason we struggle with this is that sometimes it's a spiritual thing. I believe that Satan has done everything he can to hijack the celebration that should go into worshiping our king during this time of the year. I think that some of it has to do with what you and I define what peace is, right? I mean, think about this for a minute. For some of us, peace is warm thoughts, peace is happy thoughts, peace is nice thoughts and, and about everything and everyone, 
For some of us, peace means, you know what, right now in my life, there are no circumstances that are hard or they're going to trouble me. But did you know that biblical peace, what's talked about in the Bible, has truly little to do with our circumstances? Did you know that? In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is talking to the church. And so if you have your Bibles, you can flip over and look at that. But here's what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, arene, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So Paul tells us that we aren't supposed to be anxious about anything. But my question is, how is that possible? Right? Because he's not talking about our feelings here. Right? Because, again, like I said, first service, our feelings, I think, are our feelings. That, that's what they are. We, sometimes we can't help those. But he's also not talking about that you should never allow a circumstance to come into your life that might be troubling. No, when he wrote this, this, this word is written in the present active tense. And so for those of you that, like myself, weren't grammar majors, right, it means he's talking about the ongoing anxiety in a person's life. He's talking about an ongoing state. It's this perpetual anxiety that Paul wanted to address in our life, not just a momentary anxiety where it's, ooh, that one sent me off the rails just a little bit, right? I love this quote by Max Lucado. Uh, he authored a book called Anxious for Nothing. Anyone ever read that book or know that book? Here's something he said. He said this, that the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety is optional. Did you catch that? The presence of anxiety, those feelings, those circumstances, those are unavoidable in this life. But he says the prison of anxiety is optional. Right? There's so many things that can put you and I into that prison of anxiety. Guys, we've talked a lot about them over the last several weeks during this series. Right? And if you this morning find yourself in that prison of anxiety and stress and worry and concern, my question for you is this. How can we possibly worship our king in this time of year in the way that he deserves? Right? That's a valid question. Guys, we, there's a lot of money that goes into Christmas. And for some people, they're looking at that, hoping that that's going to bring them happiness. Right? They're hoping today that as they open the presents tomorrow underneath the tree, that whatever they open is going to bring them happiness and joy and, 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 the pe and peace. But that peace that we're talking about, let's face it, for many of us, this is the time of year when we buy this year's gifts with next year's money. And guys, is there not stress involved in that? Absolutely. Why? Because you and I know that those payments are coming soon. They're actually coming due in 30 days. You know, I heard a saying this week that said, Christmas is a magical time of year. I just watched all my money magically disappear. <laughs> right? <laughs> is that the magic of Christmas that we're hoping for? I hope not. But that's real for a lot of people. And then there's the stress that comes along with schedules. And there's, guys, there is no people group on earth that, or ever has been that runs at a faster pace than Americans. Would you agree with me? We run at such a frenetic pace all the time. And so then this time of year rolls around and you add the decorating, you add the cooking, you add the hosting, you add the parties, you, maybe you add the traveling right, or other people are traveling, all that adds up. And then not to mention, there's some real relational expectations for some of us. There are people that we wish were a part of our Christmas who won't be. There are others that are going to be a part of our Christmas that we would not have chosen them to be, right? <laughs> yeah, let's be honest, right? Okay. I heard this from a guy by the name of Les Dawson, and this is what he said. He said, my mother-in-law has come around to our house at Christmas seven years running, and this year, there's going to be a change. This year, we're going to let her in, <laughs> right? <laughs> I 
But that represents some of this relational struggle that we often feel about the people we're going to spend the next 24 to 48 hours with, right? And if we're being honest, some of them, if we had a choice, we probably wouldn't be choosing to spend time with them. You know, some of our expectations or some of the things that add stress are oftentimes self-imposed, are they not? For example, I put expectations on myself that I think people have for me that may not even be real, right? They're self-imposed. And for me, you know what mine is? is my schedule. My schedule is a big deal for me, right? Because I try to cram a lot into every day, and that typically plays out most badly when I'm driving. Can I get an amen? Anybody else in here that happens to you? Okay. Again, some of that is my fault because of the schedule that Brad Brenner is trying to keep. And when I'm trying to get somewhere and I'm trying to have a pace that other people don't feel compelled to have, it causes me to stress out. Then there are things that happen in our schedule that we can't do anything about. Those hard things, those unforeseeable things, the things that sometimes are caused by other people, that things that we never would have planned for them at all. Guys, and those things are tough. And guys, here, I'm not trying to make light of those things this morning, okay? This morning, some of us are in those situations right now, right? Because some of us maybe recently lost a loved one, somebody that's suffering a great illness right now, maybe somebody who has terminal cancer or a terminal illness of some sort, Right? Some people are staring down the barrel of financial ruin. And some people, their families are so fractured and dysfunctional, all that they want them to be is whole again. Those things squeeze us, right? Those things cause real stress. And I'm not trying to say that those things can be avoided, but those things, any of those things, can they not distract us from what God wants us to experience this year? Absolutely. So what does it mean when Paul said in Philippians 4 that you and I should have a peace that transcends all understanding? Guys, because he's not talking about the warm feelings, right? He's not talking about that we can have peace because God's removing all the hard stuff and all the things that we, sh- that we wouldn't choose and all the things that, you know, we don't like or all the things that we don't understand. In fact, just the opposite is true. The peace that transcends understanding that Paul is talking about, I mean, even though those things are going on, just think about Mary and Joseph, right? Just like the things that happen in our life. You know, sometimes people look at us and they ask this question, how can you possibly have peace despite the circumstances that you're going through? Note this. It says, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, but in the last verse, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Guys, those three words matter. In Christ Jesus. Those three words matter. That verse is telling us that this peace that we're talking about comes from being a follower of Jesus Christ. And you cannot get it anywhere else. Luke 2, he says, the announcement of the angels said this, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to to those with whom God is pleased. Who is God pleased with? Again, it's those who obediently follow him, right? I mean, we can make a case that God loves everyone, right? And there's nothing that you can do that will stop God from loving you, but it says that he's pleased with those who have chosen to follow him. In the gospel of Jesus, there is good news and there's bad news, okay? The bad news is if you're not following Jesus, you can't have the peace that I'm talking about here this morning because it only comes from the Holy Spirit being active in your life, right? From the perspective that comes from being a Christ follower. And the good news is that anybody who calls on the name of Jesus who decides to follow him can have that peace that transcends all understanding. But the question is, how do we get it this morning? Well, that lack of peace that maybe you're experiencing in large part, I'm going to share with you, I think, is a perception problem. Here's what I mean. I would say this, especially if you're a Christian and you struggle with ongoing perpetual anxiousness, right, 
It's because all of us in this room have a broken belief system. All of us in this room have habits that cause us to feel that stress that enters into our life. Think about this. When I was little, and maybe you were little too, we had mostly stress-free Christmases, didn't we? For the most part. And it had to do with the fact that you were not in control, right? You weren't driving to your relative's house. You weren't buying the presents. You weren't cooking the meals. Somebody else was in control, and there was great comfort in that. And Brad Brenner, in no way, shape, or form, assumed that I was going to be able to bring peace to anybody else or create the perfect Christmas moment for them. That wasn't on me. And folks, we need that same perception today <coughs> that someone else is in control. Right? So there's this belief system that God is sovereign. Right? And that should bring us peace to our hearts and our minds. Would you agree with me today? Do you believe that God is sovereign? Okay? Now, sovereign, that word sovereignty is a term the Bible uses to describe God's perfect control of everything in the universe that he preserves and that he governs, governs every element. So let me ask you again. Do you believe that God is sovereign? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Man, that was weird. Now, here's the thing, though. Most of us in here probably would say, yep, I, I agree with that. I agree with the fact that, that God is sovereign, right? Right? And you would say, and, and, and he's in control, right? It's kind of like in the name, right? God, so we kind of agree with that. But where we struggle is that we don't understand that God cares. We don't understand that God knows. We don't understand that God's in control of the circumstances in my life. Oftentimes what we believe is that God is a disconnected, dispassionate God. Now, if you have your Bibles, would you open up to Psalms chapter 139 and look at verses one? through five with me. <clears throat> Got this bug going on in my throat here. All right, so Psalms 139, one through five says this. Oh Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say. And even before I say it, Lord, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing, he says, on my head. Now, does that sound like a disconnected, dispassionate God to you? No. He knows everything about your life. He cares. He's involved. God is continually involved in all created things, including you and me. And so in the treatment of our anxiety... A proper understanding of God's sovereignty is huge, right? And here's why. Anxiety is often the consequences of perceived chaos. Did you catch that? Anxiety is often the consequences of perceived chaos. So if you're sitting here today and you sense that you're a victim of unseen, turbulent, random forces, then yes, we get distressed. We get troubled. Let me ask you this question. How many of you, if you're honest this morning, are like me? How many of you are control freaks? Yeah. Okay. Good. Because though we are the ones that struggle with stress the most. Amen? Because why? The more we try to control things, the more we realize that we're not in what? Control. Okay. And that just makes us stressed out. For example, I try to control things through my routine. I'm a rule follower. Anyone else like to be a rule follower? Yeah. Woo. Okay. I also like my schedules. Newsflash, though, I'm not in control. God is in control. Guess what? God doesn't need your help, and God doesn't need my help. I struggle with that because I really think he does, but he doesn't. Right? Some of you in this room, you know, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Now, I want to do something with you all, you know, right now. So everybody in the room, raise your right hand. Everybody. Come on, okay? And repeat after me, I, state your name. Guys, first service was horrible at this. You guys almost, be, don't say state your name. Put your name in that place, okay? Let's try this again. 
I state your name, hereby resign as ruler of the universe. Doesn't that feel good? Isn't that freeing to know that, right? I mean, it's no longer our responsibility, guys. It's God's, I and mean, that's good. Do you see, though, the importance of, of, of a good view of sovereignty? But here's another belief system that you got to look at, too, and it's the belief system that has to do with God being good. We may agree that God is sovereign, but do you believe that God is good? Because here's where this kind of comes into play. A lot of people believe that God is sovereign. They believe he's in control, but oftentimes I run into people that are left bitter and angry because they don't think that God's doing a good job with it. And here's why. It's all because they don't understand. The understanding of God's sovereignty is good, but that understanding is not enough. We have to understand and believe that God is good as well. right? The Bible is an entire book of God's goodness from beginning to end. Think about it. He created us. Did God have to create us? No, but he did, right? He gave us the owner's manual. He gave us the word of God to, to understand this is how you live a blessed life. He provides everything that you and I need, not what we want, but everything that we need. And Isn't that awesome that he doesn't give us everything we, we want? Because there's a lot of things I want that aren't good for me. How about you? Is there a lot of things you want that isn't good for you? Yeah, okay. But here's, here it is. The Bible says that he will never leave us or forsake us, that God's very nature is goodness, that he can't not be good. He's so good, in fact, that even though we sin and fell short of the glory of God, the Bible says that you and I deserve eternal death but because of that, it says that he made a way, he sent his son to bring grace, mercy, and forgiveness. That's what we celebrate tomorrow. That's what we celebrate today, right? We celebrate that every day to give us a chance at eternal life through Jesus. Guys, is that not a good God? Because when you understand the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God, guys, it changes how we see the world. It doesn't stop the hard things from happening in our life. It just changes our perspective, you know, now we go, well, yeah, I don't understand it. I wouldn't have chosen this. But I know God's in control. I know he's good. Somehow he's going to use this for his glory and my benefit. And so our perspective changes. Let me ask you this question. What allowed Mary and Joseph to do all the things that they did, to go through all of what they went through? What, what allowed them to go through all those things? I mean, after all the things that you and I have talked about over the last several weeks, the only way that they were able to go through is because they had an internal perspective. And that's important for us today. They had to have an internal perspective. Now, don't hear me say that they didn't doubt. I personally think that they did. I think they're human, just like you and I are, correct? I mean, how could you not doubt going through the stuff that they went through? Can you imagine you know, as they're walking through going, man, God, are you sure this is right? I mean, especially Joseph, for example. Did you guys ever catch that under the angel's visitation to Mary, that apparently that happened while she was awake? Did you ever catch that? That happened while she was awake, right? But Joseph's visitation came in a what? In a dream. So what was Joseph doing? Sleeping. So I want you to understand something here. I mean, I think Joseph at least had to have said, did the angel really visit me? Or was that just bad lamb shanks last night? You know what I mean? Like, think about that for a minute. They had to have questioned. And yet the eternal perspective that God is sovereign, that God is good, is what caused them to go, God, I don't understand it, but I'm going to follow you no matter what. See, God wants you and I to know his peace this Christmas and not just this Christmas, but beyond, forever, right? He does not want us to understand this false peace that says, hey, everything's going to go my way and everything's going to be easy in life. He wants you and I to have a peace that comes from knowing God's good, he's faithful, he's God, and guess what? He cares about you. And maybe you need to hear that this morning, that he cares about you. Guys, there's this prophecy in the book of Isaiah 
about the Messiah, about Jesus. And I think Mary and Joseph would have known this, being the good Jews that they were. But Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says this. I want to read it to you. For a child is born to us, a son is given, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called, what is it, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David and for all of eternity. So this is looking forward to the future when Jesus' eternal kingdom will be here. But it says that he's called the prince of what? Of peace. Folks, he is the prince of peace today. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. So God wants you to have that peace we're talking about now, today. The Bible, again, true peace only comes from making him Lord of your life. And so today, if you're a Christian, or if you're not a Christian, excuse me, if you haven't given your life to following Jesus, man, I can't implore you enough today that you need to. That today needs to be your day. Because you cannot experience this peace that we're talking about without it. Now, again, I'm not a huge fan of bumper stickers. Anybody not a huge fan of bumper I hate bumper stickers most often because they're always kind of trite and cheesy. Anyone agree with me on that? But there's one that I really like, and I want you to picture it. It says this, no Jesus, no peace. So K-N-O-W, no Jesus, K-N-O-W, no peace, okay? Meaning that if you don't know Jesus, you can't know the peace that we're talking about today, right? And, and, and again, if you haven't made him Christ and Lord of your life, Again, I would love for you to talk about that with you today. But underneath that, it says this. No Jesus, N-O. No peace, N-O, peace. So no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. And again, my prayer for you is that if you're dealing with a lot of stress, anxiety, and worry, right, especially if it's of the perpetual nature, then you need a perspective change this morning. Maybe you've forgotten that God is sovereign. Maybe you've forgotten that God is good. And the way that, in that which that typically happens for me is being reminded of his faithfulness and reminded of his promises. And so for those of you who are believers, as the worship team comes up, we are called to be his ambassadors, right? People who represent him well to a dying world, a world that is broken. Why? Because they need him. Guys, we're supposed to represent him in everything that he is, right? Including what? The Prince of Peace. So let me ask you this question. Do you represent that Jesus is the Prince of Peace? Do you re represent that well to the world around you? Do you represent that well to the world around you? If not, can I ask you, will you choose today to represent that well to the world around you? Will you choose to do that? Will you choose to represent that well today? My prayers, I hope that you will. We would like to thank you for spending part of your day here with us. Our mission here at Centralia Christian Church is to help people build full-time relationships with Jesus. If you would like more info on the ministry or giving opportunities, visit us online at www.centraliachristian.org.